For Jim, there were many ways home. He found it in his close connection to nature. He knew and embraced his heritage, giving him a sense of direction through good times and bad. Jim received the values of love and respect from a remarkable lineage of spiritual leaders, including his great-grandfather, the Reverend James Seti Sr., an embodiment of Wakuhtuin. The Reverend James Seti Sr. grew up immersed in the teachings of his family and his people, the Cree, and in 1881 wrote an account of his childhood. My grandfather had been elected chief of all tribes living along the coast of the Hudson Bay. At the feast, he was called to invoke the gods of the air to come and take part of the food. The Reverend James Seti Sr. was an author and artist whose writing and sketches now give unique insight into the history of the Cree. He was an advocate for land issues and economic independence for his people. He had an enduring partnership with his wife, Sally, a member of a prominent mixed-blood family. He forged new ground in his dedication to the values he found common in both his Cree tradition and the new Anglican teachings. As a young lay priest in 1846, he founded what is now the famous Stanley Mission in northern Saskatchewan, currently the oldest active parish in Western Canada and a National Historic Site. The Reverend James Seti was able to nurture the values common amongst all people. After breakfast, the Indians and Icelanders assembled in one Indian house. I preached from John 4.16. The words were, God is love. First to the Icelanders, and then to my people. First in Cree, and then in Soto. The Reverend James Seti Sr., September 24, 1877. His descendants, following his example, became dedicated spiritual leaders. His son, the Reverend John Richard Seti, risked his life serving victims of smallpox. His grandson, John Robert Seti, was a respected school teacher and lay priest. His great grandson, our Jim Seti, was born in 1911 to Metis and First Nation parents John Robert and Catherine at Montreal Lake in central Saskatchewan. From an early age, he was immersed in the values of the Anglican faith, and through the Cree tradition, he developed a deep connection with the land. As he grew older, this rich heritage would guide and sustain Jim in the face of very great difficulties. The first of his life challenges came when Jim wanted to go to high school. He had to leave the tutelage of his father to attend the Onion Lake Residential School. Conditions in the residential school system destroyed traditional Aboriginal culture and left children vulnerable to abuse. In 2008, the Canadian government formally apologized and began the process of compensating students. While at school, Jim managed to find ways to quietly mentor his fellow students and later, as an elder, help many heal from their experience. I spent a lot of time in residential school, but like I said before, that my dad died when I was about two and a half, three years old, and I did not have a father figure to, to look up to, and it was very difficult. And I listened to a lot of uh, elders, uh, like Jim, for instance, when he said that uh, uh, love and respect, and, 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 and uh, rather than uh, shouting at people or hollering at your children or one thing or another, Talk nice to them, you know, that's what he used to say. When Jim graduated from school, he found seasonal work. In the winter, he hauled freight with horse and sleigh. In the spring, he built highways, and in the summer, he fought forest fires. In all of these jobs, he met elders who taught him about history, traditions, and the land. He later passed this wisdom on to others. I think. People just felt good around him, listening to his stories. I can see him yet around a fire, a campfire, and he'd have us all laughing. He was telling me about uh, how to cook and eat, eat a pelican. 
And he says, yeah, get your pelican and you pluck the feathers off him and cut him up and throw him in a big pot, throw in a couple of pieces of two by four and boil him for three days. And after three days, you throw away the pelican and eat the two by four. <laughs> So <laughs> don't forget that. <laughs> Jim's community included First Nation and Métis communities settled around several lakes in central Saskatchewan. By the early 1920s, tourists and business people began building cabins throughout the region, and in 1927, Prince Albert National Park was formed. The establishment of the park created another challenge for Jim and his people. When the park opened, everyone was told they had to move, but the business people and tourists were given extensions or were granted cabin lots. Most long-term residents whose ancestors had lived in the area for thousands of years had to move immediately. Jim's people had to leave everything behind. Hunters returned to empty cabins, their families gone overnight. The Métis were not allowed to move with their First Nation relatives onto the surrounding reserves. They joined thousands of homeless Métis across the province. Growing up with this history, Jim responded by helping his people stay connected to their communities. He remembered the families and their homes around the many lakes in the region and for the next 80 years, he kept their stories alive. If you told him your name, he knew who you were related to. He could tell you your family tree almost. That, that's how well he knew a lot of these people. You know, I bought the one who wasn't busy learning. But I think it's the same. I won't tell you the same about what I said, no. My cocky there got the white rock skis, yeah. He wasn't losing anything, he talked about someone. He gave it to you one month and he said, and told you he was, what's your problem? I said, no. <laughs> 